We have the three origin planes here, and I created a plane offset by 0.1 millimeters. Why? Because I noticed that this area wasn't exactly aligned with the plane even though I used it to make the cut. This happens because in the cutting area the mesh has high and low spots and it doesn't perfectly align. And you'll understand what I mean shortly. Here's the thing. If you look at the mesh and use the command called create mesh section sketch, select the body and then select this cutting plane, what will happen is that it should in theory, create a continuous curve along the cutting area. But notice that it creates here, in orange, a series of intermittent segments. That's not desirable at all. So, what I did was create a plane slightly to the right, in this case 0.1 millimeters. It won't make a significant difference, and this way it generates a continuous curve. I'll repeat the operation, and now, instead of selecting the reference plane, I'll use the plane I just created. You can already see in the preview that now. The curve is continuous. This was necessary because I previously cut the piece in half to create symmetry. If you have the entire piece, this will work well with the base reference plane. So, what is this? This, in practice, is a sketch we created. Notice here in the browser that the sketch contains an element called Mesh Section 5. I'll edit this sketch. Now, I'll perform an operation and explain why. This line you see here in orange, can you see it? It is slightly to the right of the symmetry zone, which is 0.1 millimeters. It's nothing more than an exact copy of these polygons that are part of the mesh. This means that, in practice, it's not a curve but rather a set of straight segments all joined together to give the appearance of a curve. This creates a problem. If I extrude this element composed of straight segments, I will get a faceted object, which is not what I want. We need to solve this issue. To do this, follow these steps. Go to the Create menu and select Fit Curve to Mesh section. After applying it, you'll see this window. This tool allows you to turn the set of segments into curves. But note that there are several options. I don't want the segments to turn into a line or an arc. That's not what I want. I want the curve to turn into a spline. That's the option I want. There are also some additional options related to the spline. If I want a closed curve, that's not useful in this case. It would join the two ends of the spline to close it. It would also close these areas at the front, but I'm not sure without testing it first. Beyond this, there are other available options, transforming it into a circle or transforming it into an ellipse, neither of which is relevant here. What does matter is this, part direction. You can define the shortest path or the longest path. I'll use the first option, short path. This parameter here, this parameter here, spline fit tolerance, determines how it will adapt to the polygonal element. I'll keep it at 0.01, .01, and I want my curve to start here and end here. Done. Notice that it created a curve in the interval from here to there. Let's accept this and close the sketch so you can preview what happened inside the sketch. The mesh section 5, which is the orange curve, I'll hide it for now, and it contains this newly created curve. Now, this is a curve and not a set of segments. Still, I could adjust that 0.01 to make it smoother. In this case, a lower value implies a greater tolerance, meaning it will move further from the initial segments, creating a spline with fewer points. I'm a bit concerned that the value might indeed be too low, so it may need adjustment. But let's proceed with this value because after all this is parametric and associative CAD software which will allow us to change the value if necessary. To recap, what I'm doing is extracting geometric elements to eventually create a sweep or a loft. In other words, extracting the curves from this 3D object to recreate the model, but this time with complete control over the surfaces created. Unlike what happened previously, this approach results in something much better than a scanned object in the form of a 3D mesh. 
If done well, the result will not only offer greater flexibility for future adjustments, but will also result in a model that is more geometrically and dimensionally perfect. This is the current situation. I should also point out that this process could potentially take more time as it involves the use of a larger set of commands. Let's continue. Now, I want to create something that defines the curve in this direction. I don't want to extend it all the way down because that would complicate things a bit. Let's create a new plane parallel to this one here, dragging it over there. Let's just check where it is. Okay, a little further back. Maybe I'll align it roughly with this higher area. That seems good to me. Except, the plane has been created. Let's just make it visible. There it is. The plane was created. And now we are going to extract a new curve. It will be the same process as before. Select the body, followed by the section plane, which is this one, and accept. Once again, we have the new sketch. We can find the sketch here in the browser and edit it. When editing the sketch, we proceed in the same way as before. Perform the same command and select the curve. Now, here we have a problem. If we zoom in, we'll see that the other curve is around here. And the new curve obviously starts at this point and goes to the other side, ending at the edge of the mesh. In this case, no matter how much I want it to, it would be pure luck to have a point here that exactly coincides with the intersection of the blue curve, which, as I mentioned, is no longer exactly aligned with the mesh. Remember, it has already been affected by a tolerance when it was transformed into a spline. It might now be slightly above or below. And this is a relevant issue. I'll click here, roughly near that curve, because the tool only accepts zones where vertices exist. In any case, don't worry. Let's accept it. It will work if the difference isn't too big. I'm going to create a new curve in this zone, which will go approximately down to here. For that, I need a new plane. Now, switching to the top view, this might seem like a time-consuming process, but I assure you, the traditional process based on 2D images or photographs is more time-consuming, especially since you can't be sure whether you're creating the references correctly. There are more advanced tools like projecting two-dimensional curves to create a single three-dimensional curve. That is, projecting two two-dimensional curves to generate one three-dimensional curve. This is possible, but it adds another level of complexity to the process, which doesn't help beginners. Moving on. Here's the situation. I'll recenter the model. Here I'll apply the same command again, accept, click OK, and enter this sketch to edit it. Let's rotate a little and, once again, use fit curves to mesh section with the same parameters. Maybe I'll place it here and there and we'll accept and finish the sketch. After that, hide the section again as it's no longer needed. And now let's also hide the mesh to make the model more visible. If at this point the goal was to create a simple lofted surface, it would be quite simple. That is, I accidentally clicked on extrude all I'd need to do is click loft, select this curve, select this one, and it's done. Now, will it accept this curve, even though it doesn't intersect the loft sections? This CAD software has surprised me a few times, accepting situations that wouldn't be possible in other software. I think, in this case, there's some probability it won't accept this rail, but I'll give it a try. So, I'll add a rail here, select the curve, and it accepted it. Now, does this reflect positively or negatively on this application? That's not an easy question to answer because it really depends on the perspective we're analyzing. Undoubtedly, it has greater tolerance. The algorithm forced the intersection of the guides. How it did that? I don't know, but I'd like to. Did it alter its position and, in doing so, move the curve? If so, that could be a problem in certain situations. In this case, it's clearly not an issue because we're doing reverse engineering, which is inherently a process prone to errors. I'm just checking everything here. 
I activated the option that says Tangent Edges to preview the reticulated surface. If that happened, the extracted elements might not be splines as perfect as they seem at first glance, but everything seems fine and we now have a curve that truly defines the top of the analyzed object. What's next? The next step might involve extending this surface so that it has a larger area and then applying a trim to the surface, creating a good panel to work with. The remaining additional elements, like the border and other details, would be added later through operations such as sweep, loft, ruled, and others. Now, let's see what we have before the loft. We had a few sketches here. This one, this one, and this one. If I created a plane now, either at that edge or closer here, I could extend this surface even further forward. We can try this just to experiment and see if we can really create a surface with a larger area without using the extend command. Let's create a plane somewhere around here, maybe like this. Here we have this area covered by the section. I think I can make use of something more here. Let's edit the sketch, then the curve. The curve now starts roughly here and ends before that area over there, like this. I'll try the loft again to see if we still get lucky. Menu surface, loft. Here, we already have an advantage. Why? Because it will naturally generate the curvature without needing rails. Okay, it's already creating the curvature. If, for some reason, it was no longer possible to activate this rail, we would still have an approximate curvature. And this curvature should already be quite close to the mesh model. Let's check. Yes, it looks good. It's in the area where it should be. Even so, I'll try again with the rail. And yes, it still managed to do it with the rail. Impressive. As we add more guidelines in the areas that are below or above the reference, we can get the surface even closer to the base model. But it's important not to overdo it, because at a certain point, you might start replicating the imperfections of the base model. We could add another rail here if we thought this area wasn't quite right. We can try, why not? Let's start the construction. Here, a little further back. Perhaps here and accept. Mesh. Select the body, select the plane, and edit the sketch again. In this case, we're already working with Sketch 9. The process repeats itself, so I'll stop commenting on every detail of what I'm doing. Continuing. Okay, I'll hide the section here. Once again, this can be hidden. Notice that in practice, we're already starting to assemble the part. It looks like the typical structure of a piece being modeled from scratch, without references. We already have one, two, three transverse curves and two lateral curves. It will be necessary to extend this transverse curve until it reaches the rightmost lateral spline. And now, we've managed to create the entire area. It extends down to this point, okay, but this point went too far. It should have stopped in that area. Why? Because there's no part there. And for that reason, it even starts lifting. But that has to do with how the curve is being generated. I'd say that, in this case, we can approach the piece in two ways. The first by using T-splines, and the second by extracting geometric elements, such as splines, from the mesh. We've explored various advanced modeling techniques in Autodesk Fusion, focusing on T-splines, surface modeling, and reverse engineering workflows. These videos aim to bridge the gap between theoretical knowledge and practical applications.
providing you with the tools and confidence to approach complex projects with ease. As we conclude this series, I hope you've gained valuable insights and feel inspired to implement these methods in your own designs.